Thank you, Leslie, for the introduction. And I may seem to be the odd one out here being from the University of Hong Kong, but I do actually have a Swedish grandmother. So, oh, yeah, can also tell a little Svenska. Okay, so today my presentation is about closing the participation gap in the Arctic, specifically when it comes to governing and managing infrastructure projects. So, um, to just get started here, I think it's important to define one key term, which is governance, so that we're all on the same page. So what is governance? Well, effectively, it's really the norms and rules and regulations that govern all sorts of social processes and collective action at a range of scales, ranging from the city to the nation state to much wider regions like the Arctic. And so in the literature, the shift um, that we've seen in the past 10, 20, 30 years has been identified as one from being from government to governance. So what that means effectively that it, is that it's no longer just nation states that are taking charge of affairs. We have cities that are involved in these discussions. We have indigenous peoples organizations, multinational corporations, and then of course um, intergovernmental forums such as the Arctic Council. Now the Arctic Council has been a remarkably open and progressive forum compared to many of the other forums that govern different regions in the world. Um, since its inception in 1996, of course, as we all know, it has included the six permanent participants as part of its kind of membership structure. And these six indigenous peoples organizations must be consulted on all decisions before they are made. So quite an open um, uh, governance structure here that we see. Um, the Arctic Council has, of course, gone further. So in 2013, not without controversy, the um, number of observer states expanded to include five Asian countries, um, and also Italy, and then most recently Switzerland was added to this list. And this, is, this kind of expansion has been done in reaction to increasing global recognition, as we've all heard here, of the Arctic as being a region of global significance for the whole planet. So here at an Arctic Circle Forum in Reykjavik a few years ago, we have delegates from countries like Singapore talking about how Arctic climate change, Arctic globalization affects their country as well. Um, at the same time, there are some risks to the Arctic Council and to governance in the Arctic more widely of kind of going global. There's a risk perhaps of overextending this type of governance. And this has been brought to light in, a in the Kitagaruit Declaration, which was issued by the Inuit Circumpolar Council about three, four years ago. And in this declaration, they talked about, you know, they, they recognized the Arctic Council for having done a lot already to include peop local people, indigenous peoples in the governing structure but they also tried to emphasize and warn that issues arising outside of the Arctic should not detract the Arctic Council from its important work. Um, and I think one issue where we can kind of see these risks coming to light is in terms of Arctic infrastructure development. So increasingly we see Arctic infrastructure as talked about and framed about at a very global scale. So to illustrate, we have headlines such as this one from Bloomberg about how the world has discovered a $1 trillion ocean and that the types of infrastructure that needs to be built from runways to ports really concern bringing resources out of the Arctic to global markets in places like Asia, Europe, and North America. So these are the kind of discussions going on at certain higher levels, and there's also a current discussion about how can we bridge this global infrastructure gap. So this kind of infrastructure gap is something that we hear a lot about, especially in a place that's kind of short of infrastructure, such as the Arctic. But we don't hear as much about the participation gap that I think is important to to emphasize here, which is kind of, well, how are we going to really integrate and not just hear the opinions of local people, but how are we going to integrate their opinions into decision making about what types of infrastructure get built? Because it's not just ports and runways that we need, but also schools, um, internet connections, broadband, hospitals, things like that that are important as well. So I think with this participation gap that um, is very much present in Arctic governance, um, there have been important measures already made to address this, but kind of more, at least in some perspectives, from the outside. So the Arctic Investment Protocol perhaps is um, one thing that's been spearheaded by a number of, of important people who are probably in attendance here at this meeting is something that's going, I think, um, taking an important step in terms of closing that participation gap and making sure that locals are recognized in these major development projects that are being funded from the outside in the Arctic. But more can still be done. Um, so I think to just kind of um, draw a few on a few case studies here, which actually I'm not an expert on, so I'd like to learn more about these case studies from the North Atlantic. Um, one is, of course, so the uh, mobile connections here, the 4Gs, or maybe even 5G is quite remarkable, I suppose. And um, in some part, this can be, this, can be um, this is thanks to the cooperation between the Faroe Islands and Chinese telecom company Huawei, which upgraded the um, telecoms here with the cooperation of a Portuguese contractor as well. So this was done and there's kind of a blog post by a Huawei contractor who is working here and it's headlined, why did the Faroe Islands want to raise this, the red flag? So perhaps a little bit 
controversial headline, but um, kind of an interesting story here and perhaps a success story because we can all watch YouTube videos whenever we want in the bottom of a tunnel. So pretty exciting. But I think this is interesting and perhaps ironic for two reasons. One is that over in the US, the conversation is really about banning companies like Huawei and other Chinese telecoms from selling cell phones on US military bases um, because there's kind of these worries about geopolitical and interstate competition between China and the West. And we see this kind of fear arising in terms of um, Greenland now, which is uh, wanting to build and upgrade three different airports in its country. So the government of Greenland has shortlisted six different companies um, in this bidding process, one of which happens to be a Chinese contractor. And this um, you know, has really uh, made, drawn a lot of concern out of Copenhagen, probably for these kind of geopolitical reasons. So what we see here is perhaps um, going back to the Kitagaryuit Declaration, a chance that this kind of interstate competition outside of the Arctic may affect the chance for global capital to successfully, successfully realize local projects. So I think there's a need to try and uh, match up these, these interests at a local and global scale um, in the Arctic. Um, so yes, this can kind of perhaps be called the politicization of infrastructure, which is done perhaps at the risk of um, uh, kind of short-sighted decisions in the Arctic for local needs. Um, okay, so to kind of carry this idea forward, I think it's important if we can try and match up global and local um, needs in the Arctic with kind of projects that perhaps meet both global demands and local needs simultaneously, which can perhaps be called dual purpose infrastructure. So I just want to draw on my own um, research experience, which, um, so I've done field work not in the North Atlantic, but rather in Northwest Territories of Canada. And here there was a pretty exciting project that was just finished last November, so you may have heard about it. Um, Canada recently completed the construction of the first highway to the Arctic Ocean. So you can now drive all the way north to the town of Tuktoyaktuk, which is a, pop, a hamlet of about 900 people, which sits on the Arctic Ocean coastline just there. And um, so, oops, this, um, this all-weather highway was built to replace an ice road. So the seasons for um, ice roads, oh, so the seasons for ice roads have been shortening, so there's been a real need to try and um, kind of build the type of infrastructure that will last in light of climate change, um, and also build infrastructure that will connect to new passages like the Northwest Passage, and perhaps also access oil and gas resources. At the same time, this road project was very important for the local communities because now there's a year-round connection between Inuvik and Tuck. And in my research, what I found was it wasn't so much the fact that these big geopolitical transformations are happening in the Arctic, but really the empowerment of the local Inuvialuit um, indigenous people um, who basically can have a say, they, they have much more than participation, but they control what type of development happens on their lands. So they were able to convince the government using these narratives of kind of major geopolitical transformations to their own advantage and convince Ottawa to spend $300 million to fund this 130 kilometer road. So a um, major transformation in the Arctic, in the Canadian Arctic, that has successfully linked two communities, but also links Canada to the Arctic. So I think we see here a real kind of synthesis between local and global needs. Um, and I've recently published this work in um, the journal World Development, if you're interested in, in learning a little bit more about that. Okay, so I, on the one hand, we need to kind of emphasize the right to participation in the Arctic um, and allow people to have the right to development, but I think we also need to emphasize that people should also have a right to veto a project if it's not fitting their needs as they see fit. Otherwise, we risk committing kind of past instances of uh, very misguided interventions in the region. So just um, a, on a final note here, I think one other important measure in terms of closing the participation gap in the Arctic has been the creation of the ALGU Fund, which is a mechanism to bring together um, funding from the outside, um, sometimes from observers, to support uh, the permanent participants' participation in these very expensive Arctic Council meetings. So I think kind of drawing on these processes and other projects that I've tried to highlight here is an important means to further close the participation gap in the Arctic and ensure that infrastructure is built in a responsible manner that meets local and global needs. Um, so just to sum up, I think for governance in the Arctic to be inclusive and democratic, um, it shouldn't just go global, but it should also um, go deep and be really, truly local. Thank you. Thank you.